So hello everybody and um, we're just waiting as people come and join us. Um, I'm Lucinda Brumfield, I'm currently the Secretary for ALT South. Thank you very much for coming and of course big thank you to all our speakers as well um, who are going to be telling us loads of interesting things um, over the next couple of hours and to uh, just to um, say that we're also currently ALT South, we're looking for um, some more committee members. Um, I can, speaking from personal experience, it's not a huge amount of work um, and it is fun. Uh, so if anybody would be interested, if you can drop me an email, my email's on the ALT site and we can have a chat. Um, and that was all I was really gonna say in terms of opening and I'll hand over to Manish Malik, who's our chairman. Thank you, Lucinda. Thank you for all your hard work. As you modestly say, it's, it's not a lot of work, but you have done a, a great amount of work to get us started again. We started a few years ago where we where we um, wanted to to spur up sort of research in the region, and and I got onto that track with a few old members, and and then I started my PhD as well. So that therefore we completely sort of get, got in, engrossed in the research that that we wanted to do. And I'll talk about that a bit later. But uh, but but a really big thank you to to Marin and uh, and Debbie also to to join us today and and to Ale um, uh, to to talk about their work and uh, to to sort of uh, highlight how the group sort of fits in with the uh, with the alt network. Um, I would like to just say that our group our group represents uh, you know this you can call us as a group of friends where where you can come in and have a a regular discussion with with people in the in the old south group region um that uh, things related to to learning technology some problems some challenges some sharing of good practice and and with our newly sort of replenished uh, team we, we look to uh, run a lot of sessions uh, throughout the year I mean, not a lot I mean, at least month to month we're gonna have some kind of discussion and every term some kind of um event like this where, where there will be invited speakers and and to to get some discussion sort of going uh, within the within the region in terms of our expertise when i i back my background is systematic reviews technology enhanced learning my phd area is is, is looking at uh, um, the evaluation of orchestration technology in um, engineering teams which uh, include uh, a bit about the neurotypical neuroatypical people as well. So I'm, I'm deeply interested in, in researching uh, technology enhanced learning in engineering education, really. And other people obviously uh, bring other uh, advantages. Um, Ankur's sort of going on to on a PhD in, in this area as well. Uh, he'll, he'll probably talk a bit more about it. I'm also student experience uh, related and in my, in my school here at the at University of Portsmouth. And I'm quite interested in evaluating technology enhanced learning and and um, I, I do run some sessions on uh, um, development of staff as well on that technology uh, in terms of going forward as I was saying earlier uh, there will be one meeting per term of the group and that meeting would have speakers invited so if you are aware of people who you want to hear and want to uh, you know invite them here please send those names to us we'll, we'll reach out and we'll try and organize that or if you want to do it yourself please send the details to lucinda or myself uh, and we will we'll look into that plus as i said we want to meet every so today is the last thursday of this month and we would like to continue this pattern uh, every last thursday of of a month we would like to have a one hour just informal uh, video conference like this one where we will sort of call that as tech thursdays and we come in and have a chat about the issues that we're facing, the solutions we can we can tell each other. That sort of informal approach, and that should give us an indication of what is the what are the needs of the region, what do we actually want to to know more about, and and have more sort of evidence based approach on on things. And that can be satisfied by these termly events by inviting relevant speakers and, and sort of running a a full full year like that would be our ambition how many how many things come in the way of that that's a different matter because we still don't know what's going to happen with covid um 
things things are rapidly have have been changing in the past and they continue to do so in terms of outputs from the group uh, we've already as i said earlier there's a systematic review coming up in july we want to put that into a into a publisher to, to for submission at a journal which is a huge piece of work we carried out for the last two and a half three years at least uh, if not more um we did a sort of a delayed start first year was a little bit slow then we went on to 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 pick it pick up the work quite uh, rigorously and there's all 100 and, um, well 100 1200 uh, papers we reviewed and as a summary of that it will be published in a in a journal uh, hopefully and the topic is use of technology enhanced learning to enhance uh, project based learning case based learning uh, simulation based learning all those constructivist approaches that are used in in stem subjects so that's very focused it's uh, that's uh, you know we've done a landscaping review and a systematic review so two outputs coming from that so so that's i would i'd like to that to continue uh, more people who are interested in research you know please do reach out to myself uh, and we'll we'll see if there's enough uh, interest in the areas you're you you're wanting to work in and train and even work with you to produce more more such research papers in future so that's the the um, eternal goal for me is this to keep on uh, you know, inviting people and, and engaging with them in, in this uh, type of endeavor of systematic reviews. I even have background with some meta analysis. So if that's something somebody's interested in, we can look into that too. Uh, and just quickly um, about the special interest groups and, and, and if, if people are interested, please uh, again, reach out to, to, to Lucinda about if, they, if you want to look uh, and form a little special interest group and and uh, continue discussions in, in those areas, then we're more than happy to, to, to explore that with you. I think that's a, a quick summary of what we are about and what we want to do in the coming year and beyond. Um, at that point, I'd like to, to invite uh, uh, Debbie and Maren to, to tell us how you know, the, the old and our uh, existence sort of um, work together and also give us some some sort of horizon scanning of what activities are there. So over to you, to Maren and Debbie. And thank you, Manish, and um, thank you, everyone. It's really great to be here. And, you know, I think Debbie and I have been going to quite a few members meet up, like your group. I think many other member groups are finding just a tiny bit of capacity, again, to meet up and reconnect a little bit more after a very chaotic year. So I think we're definitely here to support. And um, we also have a new colleague, Emma, who's been working with Debbie very closely on support for members groups. So I'll leave Debbie to cover all those um, bits and maybe also it might be worthwhile following up with with Emma as well who can provide some input um, what I was hoping might be useful to you um, to start off the meeting is just to give you a couple of sort of headlines from, from what's been going on across the association um, and just remind you of a couple of um, key resources that are available um, but also I hope prompt some discussion on your experience over the past year um, so I'm gonna, um, Debbie and I have got the slides that we can also circulate to the mailing list if that's helpful for everybody who can't be there. And I won't go through everything, um, but I will just do a couple of highlights of the key things that um, I wanted to talk about today. And then maybe I'll hand over to Debbie to talk about exciting developments for members. Um, one of the things I wanted to start with was to speak about our impact report that was launched um, just a week ago. And one of the things I've been really staggered about when we looked at, you know, how much has been going on across the association last year, is just at what scale of activity we've been operating. And obviously, we've also welcomed many new members as there are more and more people interested in learning technology. And it's been fantastic to see us welcome more than 5,000 participants from, uh, from 30 countries. And you know, we ran a total of over 150 webinars and workshops. Um, a lot more activity than we would have um, had if we, um, a few years ago still. And we've had some fantastic feedback about the sort of caring um, 
humane and and just kind of community focused activities that we've been doing as a professional body i think it's been really great to hear people's feedback about the past year and one of the things we've obviously been focusing on is professional recognition and development um, so we've made 60 new cmold awards last year and funded 54 scholarships and i just wanted to um, highlight the scholarships to you as a group um, either for members or if you're reaching out to colleagues. Um, we do offer fully funded scholarships for all of our events and also for CMOLD workshops. So if you're aware of anyone for whom cost is a barrier to attend, let's say the annual conference that's coming up in September, please do encourage them to apply for a scholarship. Um, that's what they're there for. And we've been having great feedback about um, how much people valued being able to take part for free. It's been interesting for us, I think, as a professional body to consider how things have changed um, over the past year and to really have more work to do than ever before to champion the value of learning technology expertise within institutions and within the wider public. So it's been interesting for me in particular to read what members have fed back to us, what they value about being a member of ALT. And I think the member groups like this ALT South group play a really big part in that. One of the other key changes for us as an association is that now more than half of our event participants and about 20% of our members overall have leadership and management roles. We have many more members getting involved who are working at senior um, levels within their institutions. And I think that's been particularly evident in the work we've been doing to develop the ethical framework for learning technology. And that's one of these sort of horizon scanning um, activities that I wanted to highlight to you. Um, and just like um, in, you know, in previous years, but maybe even more so than in previous years, we've been working to represent our members in consultation and with policymakers. There's some important pieces of work, for example, on transnational education with Universities UK, um, also working with JISC and other professional bodies like CEDA and the QAA um, and ALDIN HE and 1HE, so there's quite a lot of participation um, from our side in different collaborations to really represent the learning technology perspective. And one of the other key things that I wanted to just reflect on, and I have to say, there's been a bit of a staggering kind of volume of support for participants during the acute crisis months, which then stretched into nearly a year. And Debbie was at the forefront of running these weekly drop-in sessions. There's obviously um, many webinars still going on every month or every week, um, with I think the copyright and online learning um, group having thousands of participants alone. So Overall, in 17 member and special interest groups, we now support 500 members who are actively engaged in those groups. I don't know if there's many people from further education here in the group, but I just wanted to highlight that we've also set up a dedicated new network called Amplify FE that specifically um, supports practitioners in FE and vocational education. So if that's of interest to you as a group, then please um, do have a look at that. And I, before I hand over to Debbie, I also want to highlight the work we've been doing on our ethical framework um, in learning technology. So a working group was established last October, which is chaired by three of ALTS trustees, Bella Abrams and Sharon and Natalie um, Lafferty. And, um, and They've been working with about, I think, 120 members now, including learners and representation from industry to develop this framework. And I'm not sure if many of you have heard of this or contributed to the consultation, but here is what we hope the ethical framework for learning technology will do. Um, so for practitioners, we'll provide clear guidance and pathways to accreditation, as well as practical tools for learning technology roles. Uh, for institutions, we hope it will help inform policies and strategic decision-making in the use of digital technology for learning, teaching and assessment. 
And in, for industry, we hope it will provide a way for commercial providers to demonstrate how they're taking ethical considerations into account and engage customers in the process. Now, um, here is what we've done so far. So, um, as I said, we've started work in October, but um, six months in, in March, we did a large consultation exercise with the members' assembly. We then finalized the draft framework and then went back to test it and to gather feedback in May and June. Um, and then we reported back to members at the AGM, just as um, I'm sharing this with you now. And then now we're working in July and August to finalize the framework and the tools for launch in September. I think that's a really important piece of work and I'm very keen to take any questions that you might have as well and see um, what what your experience is if this could be useful to you um, and before I finish um, I also wanted to say that I'm not sure if many of you've made use um, from the findings from our annual survey this year but I think um, if you haven't already discovered that that might be a helpful use for you to um, baseline practice in your institution particularly when it comes to trends and tools and learning technology so and as one of the, um, I think, pieces of work that we've done this year that many members have found really useful. But I'm just going to pause there and hand over to Debbie, and then hopefully we can pick up questions and have a bit of a discussion. So, Debbie, over to you. That's lovely. Thank you, Marin. Um, yeah, delighted to be here today. It's really, really great to see um, so many engaged members, really. And I'm highly delighted to see that Alt South are kind of refreshing their um, their presence and everything. There's been lots of activity on the website and uh, what have you. So I'm looking forward to seeing where you go from here. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Debbie Baff and I'm the um, Membership and Professional Development Manager at Alt. So as part of my role, I look after our members groups, our special interest groups, I look after all of our member services and I'm also responsible for the CMALT framework um, and um, a new initiative that we've we've recently undertaken is providing open digital badges for our members. So we've literally just started this. Um, we have had um, Open Digital Badges previously, but we're now using a different uh, platform. So we're working with Open Badge Factory and um, so far we've um, we wanted a way of basically recognizing people's membership with us so that's where we've kind of started with it and we've um, issued open digital badges to our alt assembly members but more recently we've issued um, three and a half thousand badges to our members so whatever category of member somebody is in they will have received one of these um, badges we've had some really great feedback um, on twitter and directly and um you know, it's pleasing to see that, um, you know, quite a good proportion of members have already accepted their member badge and are actually sharing across uh, social media and, um, you know, fairly positive, um, positive results for it, really. So we've got lots of others that we're working on, including, which I'm sure you'll be interested in, I know Lucinda will be, <laughs> um, we're working on uh, badges to recognise our member group and our special interest group officers. So um, they'll be kind of um, coming very, very soon. I'm also working on recognition for uh, people that contribute to our blog and also our CMALT assessors because our CMALT program couldn't actually run without the help of our CMALT assessors and sometimes that um, that work is quite invisible that they do and we wanted a way of recognizing um, and uh, so that people could actually get some um, kudos for the great work that they do really so um, CMALT assessors is also on my list to develop so that will be coming soon um, and also uh, recently I've been sorting out some open digital badges for our alt c conference which takes place in september there are other badges that we're also working on but they'll come in the next phase so um i'm i'm always happy to talk badges with anybody <laughs> um we're also i should say um as well as kind of offering this we're we're looking at ways of making it easier for member groups to sort of cross collaborate with each other as well so emma that um Marin mentioned earlier on has been great. She's recently joined our team to help me look at um, the, the the kind of 
the way that we're, we're enabling people to to work together on the various presences that we have within our alt site um, and I, as part of that we're going to try and in, integrate it a bit more with our normal alt blog so hopefully that will um will kind of raise the profile of of our uh, special interest groups and our member groups as well so um emma would be more than delighted um to continue that conversation i'm sure so um i think that's me done because i don't want to take up any more time <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you debbie and here are our contact details i think many of you already have them anyway but do um do please get in touch with us and um yeah man we're gonna um hand back over um to manage now and yeah if anybody has questions or wants to discuss anything we're here Thank you, Debbie and Aaron. That was great. Um, if there are any questions, if people would like to ask, they can raise hands or put that in the chat. The badges thing just sound very interesting. And also, of course, you may have questions about the CMALT or or the the the, the framework, the ethical framework. Well, that's also uh, quite interesting to me in particular. If anybody wants to um, join the working group to just keep up to date with the um, ethical framework, I'll, um, I think Debbie's already put the link in the chat. So working group still open. Anyone can join um, and do um, feel absolutely welcome to do that. I'll ask a question. I don't know if that's uh, the right time to do that, um, but I'll ask anyways because I don't know where, when else to ask it. Uh, we keep looking as researchers for, for opportunities, for funding, for just small pots of money for doing sort of academic pedagogic research in, in learning technology. And it, yeah, it doesn't take, uh, for a small project, it doesn't take a huge amount, but I think there's still very little out there in terms of funds to do. Is this something which all looks into and, and could, could support in future? Oh, that's a um, that's a great question, Manish. I think um, I think it would be a good idea to put our feelers out with our research and learning technology editorial board because I think um, that's probably the part of ALP which um, does the most kind of research focus work. Um, we've we've funded um, scholars to attend and write about um, things for the annual conference, but other than that. Um, I'm not aware of any initiatives at the moment, so um, I'll make a note of that and investigate a bit and then report back. That's a really good prompt. Thank you. As, I mean, Ankur is going to just talk about uh, his, whenever he talks about his research, I mean, he's, he's on to a PhD and, uh, you know, there are many other people who may also want to progress in that direction. So if there's funding around, then that sort of it's a, the word's been used kudos you know it gives them them both the the, the academic uh, opportunity and kudos that they've got something funded and that looks really good on their profile so it helps yeah. them yeah one thing i'm aware of is that for any research that's um related to open education there are um funding opportunities with the gogn network um i don't know if many of you have come across that uh, i know debbie is a member of that network because she's also doing phd at the moment so um i'll put um i think they have fellowship applications open so i'll put a link in the chat to that as well Excellent. That's great. Thank you so much. Any other questions in the chat? Anybody can see? Let's have a quick scroll through. No. Okay. Well, I guess, uh, Ankur, you can come in perhaps now and, and uh, if you wish to lead that discussion that you want to about. Yeah, yeah please. Over to you. That's perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Manish. And thanks, Maran and, and Debbie for the initial information. Um, morning, all. Uh, my name is Anka Shah. I, I work in the Faculty of Business and Law as a technical and e-learning manager. Um, and just while Manish mentioned, just to give everyone uh, a brief info about my PhD I'm in my first year anyways, I've got my operational knowledge, but I, I thought I might as well improve my academic side of things by doing a PhD. So I'm, I'm doing a PhD in digital transformation because obviously with the pandemic happening and everything moving towards digi digital, I thought it might be a good um, good place to start my PhD with. So currently, based on the readings and stuff so far I have done, I'm sort of looking into processes and how industries across the sector or even higher education, how they've improved the processes and whether they are digitally transformed based on the digital maturity model. Um, and then just 
based on that going forward in terms of doing my collection of, of data and doing my research and potentially answering the question that I'll have down the line. But I'm um, in my early stages of my research. So it's been nearly three months I'm in because um, I started in February. So hopefully once I start reading more and more, I'll have more idea about the digital transformation sort of things and maybe I'll be able to able to share more findings um, across across the sector. Um, but ideally today's today's idea about about what I initially wanted to share, I mean you have mentioned earlier, Marin mentioned and, and Debbie as well about kudos to all the academics who have actually over the past 18 months not only evolved their style of teaching but had to adopt had to adapt to the way they were delivering their teaching. Um, and ideally what I would like to explore from the participants who've joined our session is to, to share their success stories in terms of what did they find valuable uh, for their students in the past 18 months in terms of how they delivered their, their teaching. Um, and you can, you can keep the technology to one aspect, but let's focus on the teaching pedagogy and, and the delivery style. Um, and basically share your success stories in terms of what sticks positively and what are the things that you know you would you would sort of like to what what were the things that made it possible that you would think are valuable for your students or were valuable for your students because I think it would it would form a nice foundation moving towards Ali's session um, in, in some time so I would sort of open the floor for for all our participants and I would like to ask them like making it a collaborative session I would like to ask them to share their success stories with us and then perhaps we can sort of have questions and answers in between or even even discuss about the points that they will share with us. So here's the opportunity for people to really uh, engage and, and, and contribute. Anybody would like to? Yeah, Alison is trying to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just put on my microphone because <laughs> it's that classic thing with teaching, isn't it? You wait for someone to answer. Um, I think there's a number of things um, I would take away. I'm a course director of an online distance learning masters. So I've been in quite demand over the last year in terms of trying to support uh, staff with how to uh, you know, teach in this kind of environment. Um, there's a couple of things I would I would take away and I would, you know, in, in discussion with colleagues, there are some things I think some of them have appreciated too. And this is how we um, sort of structure the resources or the combination of resources that we make available for students. So we use the Canvas platform where we would put, um, you know, a sort of module uh, basis. And I had the advantage of being able to import some digital um, resources from my on, online teaching, from my online distance learning teaching into my on-campus modules. And this means that I could then focus the time I had with them for synchronous learning to, to collaborate more in discussion, in sort of group exercises, in work that used Padlet. I use Padlet quite a lot in terms of, you know, sort of collaborative exercises. Um, and that works quite well, both in the classroom and, and online. Um, there's quite a lot of management of breakout rooms that I think we learned over time um, for on-campus students. And students that are expecting to teach, to be taught online and distance were different, are different to those who weren't. And one of the things I think I, I perceived is that that expectation and that sort of disruption in learning for on-campus students built in resistance and I think a lot of tutors found that quite difficult to overcome and I, it's not that we're not doing it well it's that the students themselves didn't know how to manage it weren't expecting to manage it they found their own time management difficult they got distracted easily um, and so on. So, you know, I think there were things around it that where we had to provide a lot more sort of support. Um, and in doing that, sorry, I'm going on a bit, but in doing that, I found regular communication with students. So I use quite a lot of sort of scheduling for communication and um, so that they knew I was sort of keeping up with them 
um, and made myself sort of accessible through those digital platforms in a way that in some ways we, we aren't as accessible when they're on campus. So that's another thing I took away that, you know, making ourselves accessible through the digital communication is sometimes easier for students to reach out to us that way than it is to come and knock on the door, um, even if we have so-called office hours. So those are a couple of things, um, and I'm sure other people have things to add to that. Um, but the, you know, the taking away from the formal lecture process by structuring other inputs so that we could use the synchronous sessions, I felt more collaboratively and supportively um, was one of the big takeaways for me. That's great. Thank you. Anybody else would like to chip in? It was very eloquently put by Alison. The some of the things I also completely sort of relate to as well, but I'll come to that in a minute. James. Yeah, hi. I, can I just uh, sorry, my I have just got my laptop re-imaged and um the, the font size is incredibly small. I think it was Alison, I think, uh, who's just talking. And I, I just like to sort of add weight to that. And I think that um, that Anchor's research might have hit on something, actually, because I think over the past sort of year or so, we, we haven't really been teaching online, in a sense. We've been transitioning. And our, student, our students... Um, did not sign up for online they they signed up for sitting in classrooms talking to us and i i've been i've got a a meeting on monday with my with my team i'm a course leader too and i've got a meeting with my team and i'm just putting together some stats um so that we can have a discussion and it's really interesting to i've only done three modules so far but what i what i've done is I, i've looked at um the correlation between what I'm calling Moodle activity, which is essentially interacting with online teaching materials, um, Zoom activity, which is sort of webinar activity, synchronous, um, and, and a sort of combined. And it's really interesting to look at the correlations between those activities and the student's performance on the module. So it's quite, it's quite interesting that um, uh, in in my module, the students there was a higher correlation between being in Zooms and their performance than there was between um, the, the online materials, which is devastating for me because I spent huge amounts of time creating H5Ps <laughs> and interactive learning experiences for the students. Now on, on other modules, it's it's different, um, and so I think um, it, it's an it's an issue sort of of how individual teaching styles have translated into um, into online environments and also pedagogies. The, the person who's got the highest number of correlations, I can't obviously, I don't want to say names on, on name modules, but the person um, who has got the highest correlations, very much the pedagogy of that module is very much geared towards uh, the performance on the assignment. Uh, and that has, as you might imagine, has created the highest number of correlations. But it's really interesting to look. Now, I haven't checked this data yet um, because obviously I, I'm, I've got these stats off Moodle. And so, you know, it's a big question mark about um, how sort of accurate that is. And I need to investigate that. <clears throat> but it's very, very interesting to see that I suspect there are going to be quite large disparities across the different modules, which have been dependent on the approaches that people have taken. Can I just say that the the person with the highest number of correlations has not gone for gone in for anything fancy. Um, they they've gone in for basically um, chunking lectures lecture material. It's quite a simplistic approach, which seems to have had the most effect. But I suspect the effect of the online is is in fact cross correlated with the personal teaching style and the pedagogy that's being adopted in the module. If I've taken this in a completely wrong direction, I do apologise. But I'm just my first meeting. No, no, it's it's absolutely fine, James. I think I think yeah, yours and Alison's view were were quite nice. Um, any anyone else? Yeah, I quite agree with yeah. There is no wrong direction. That's correct. I think. <clears throat> I think what Alison um, and James have sort of um, alluded to 
is something we we have been doing within within the faculty as well um, in in the past few months. Um, so myself, one of my other colleague Aaron and Valerie, we have been we have been actually meeting academics to find out exactly the same thing that I've asked the colleagues over here is about what has worked well for them, what sticks keenly for their students, and it, it's very interesting because I was I was trying to see whether there might be different themes coming up from here. But it's very interesting to see that the themes don't come up differently because while disc while our discussion with the academics over here and while you guys sharing your views, the first thing that I sort of picked up from from Jim and from Alison is keep it simple but make it effective sort of thing, um, which which like basically what Jim mentioned was the the academic didn't do anything fancier but they kept it simple. Then the other bit was about giving the students. Um, sort of you know having the student friendly relationship relational opportunities which is something Ellison mentioned earlier where we're doing the synchronous session with the students giving them the actual opportunities sort of things which is which is quite nice as well um, um, and in essence pretty much like to, to uh, not quoting someone else's word but it's pretty much good teaching is good teaching it doesn't matter however you do it as long as you're teaching good and students get it that's that's what good teaching means so I think I think that's that's in my context and based on what Ali is going to present, it's sort of a good icebreaker for everyone because I, I'm, I, I certainly think Ali's thing will add on to whatever people have shared over here. Um, and then I'm sure Ali will, will have, Ali will be happy to answer any questions you guys will have. So, yeah. Just uh, can I come in as well uh, before we go to Ali? Um, yeah. Yes. Um, well, it was touched upon by by Alison the the structure and and, and I've, I've immediately I'm I'm somewhat I don't know I'm I'm autistic or not but I I I, I might be somewhere in the middle of the spectrum if, if not over onto the other side um, and and as an engineer for me structure is everything you know if I see structure it makes me feel familiar in a familiar place and this year in our our university thanks to to the central team uh, you know we've had structured Moodle sites and we sort of all our um, lecturers in, in my school we just immediately lashed on to that we uh, and the students loved it too being being engineers wanting to be engineers there's some kind of something to be said about that I don't know what's the research on it but, but the, the, that structured love for structure for engineers is, is it was evident in our school at least and weekly you know organized um, Moodle learning environment with uh, time uh, sort of repeating lectures or synchronized sessions in our school we went slightly different from the university we, we did do uh, synchronous lectures uh, and many others as well did but then uh, yeah a lot of people were were doing um, pre-recorded content and, and, and materials beforehand and then try to engage them in activities in class we didn't do that we we went in with the with the lectures like it would in a face-to-face -face setting because we were aware that a we did some survey from the students in the summer we asked them what would you rather have and they said well listening to students we, we did what they said that we would rather have the lecturer being there and answer our questions if we need if we need some help from them in a real-time session and then record that session and make it available for us as well for later. The FOMO kicks in after, you know, if you if you miss a few lectures, you're always worrying what I've heard or what have I missed? The fear of missing out. And 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 so recorded lecture really addresses that very well. So structure for me, the key takeaways was structure, orchestrating students into these live sessions through sending them out the links or showing them where they can find the links, because their timetable wouldn't show them the links. You know, and the timetable appears on Google. And they have their their uh, attend uh, their, their what you call them um, yeah lectures uh, all scheduled in a week, but then they have to find the link and each each lecturer might be doing things slightly differently and it just takes a little bit longer and it might just yeah be very stressful in the beginning to coming into a lecture late some may not come into because of that but anyways after a few weeks of, of whatever we were doing students do get used to so keeping that in mind that students get used to something. And if everybody is beating in the same way that you know this is how we're doing it this is how we're doing it people just get used to that and that becomes the norm and 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 you get people coming into lectures then what do you do in lectures there was some mention about difficulties on on breakout rooms and i totally agree and students have fed back uh, you know in in all different ways that 
having sort of group work done in in these breakout rooms, it, 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 it depends really who you end up with. If somebody's going to decide decide to just be quiet and, and you're the only other person there who want to talk, you cannot have a conversation with just yourself in that. And and sometimes what happens is when the lecturer comes in there, then they start talking. And then as soon as the lecture's out, they stop talking. So group work has really not, not, we've not been able to sort of manage uh, or be sort of very good with that, I, I'd say. But other than that, you know, it's been, there's some very good positives from coming from the structure, coming from um, Moodle quizzes and, and things like that, which which help people to learn and practice um, things in, when they are when they're not in campus, they are in their rooms, so they can actually watch a video and do some quizzes. So that, that so that's that's really been been used. That'll be my two cents, and I'll I'll be quiet after that. Uh, so uh, th there is just one question, Manish, on the chat from Edward, who says. And I'm, I'm, by all me, Edward, I'm, I'm, I might not be an expert, but I'm sure there are experts over here um, in, in, our, in our room. It, Edward asked a question about how do you think the arts are dealing with online learning? Because they, they don't fit the typical structural online course. Um, but I'll, I'll sort of leave it open for colleagues to answer. But I mean, I would have my way of sort of tech side of things, but I'd rather let colleagues answer from the academic perspective. Um, I was going to observe that I think it's interesting that you're talking about engineers because I think engineers have a very structured teaching schedule where they're used to being taught for most of the day um, and that contrast with arts is quite an interesting one. I sit in social sciences, I'm part of the business school and we're probably closer to the arts model than we are to the engineering model. Also the pedagogy says that trying to sit through a, a full hour online is not the best way for learning. So we encourage staff to, although pre-record lectures, but to chunk it down into smaller elements so that students could pick it up and put it down according to their own schedule. So that, I mean, for instance, I did one course, one mod uh, module or course, depending on how you use your terminology, um, where I chunked my le my lecture element down into 20 minute sections um, because then students you know that's the attention span so if you can take it into you know there's a lot of uh, research in the pedagogy that says they're better off if they've got shorter elements um, you know to, to focus and also for taking notes and things and I think that question around arts I think that's probably where that comes in as well that if you can structure the combination of resources that signpost a different kind of balance between um, the kind of uh, online resources that you're providing um, rather than thinking, oh, we have three hours a week contact normally, let's provide them with three hours contact online or four hours contact online. Um, I think it, it's that, that challenge that students have had in managing their time and managing their study they can somehow cope better if they can chunk it a bit better. I don't know if anyone else has had that experience. I, I, I sort of agree with you on that, Alison, because we've had, um, I'm sure Jim will agree as well, we've had a similar approach within Val, because I, I work in the Faculty of Business and Law as well, and we sort of adopted that, well, when I say we, um, agreeing with the heads obviously and with their decision we sort of agreed to go with short chunks of lectures and stuff um but i think i think and I'm, I'm just adding it um in 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 the mix over here but i think while everyone followed the short chunking of lectures and stuff i think from a student perspective we did have some students that saying they like the aspect of having a live lecture because that's what gave them the the how should i put it that's what gave them the essence of learning otherwise doing short chunks lectures and then leaving students to actually look at them by themselves is one thing I think James mentioned earlier is you can't actually see whether the students are engaging with the content or not um, and it was it was sort of an it's it's there is no balance and there is no right and wrong to this but it was just sort of that one of the thing that we picked up after after a year where we we going forward for September there is a huge discussion across the faculty and across the university of how we should go with things going forward sort of thing so yeah Okay, I think if, if that's everybody's contribution, maybe we could... I, 
have we got time? I'm just sort of mindful of the time, but I think yeah. we're okay. Um, yeah. So just a couple of things um, about the arts. So I'm I'm law based, so I don't have experience of this personally, but I did um, watch um, a short presentation by a colleague who teaches um, art and sort of physical art, so painting and all of those sorts of things and sculpture. Um, and she was saying that one of the really big issues was actually getting materials. So they had to do a whole new thing with projects with found objects that students could actually work on. Um, and then they used Zoom to, to talk about things. Um, but it was it was very difficult, particularly because what they'd been doing previously relied on students being physically present to learn techniques and do various other things. So it was a very difficult year for them. But I, I don't know, is anybody else sort of arts based who could add anything? We're all we're all we're all much more <laughs> hard academic subjects, it looks like here. Um, the only other thing I was going to say was there was another question further up that I think was for James um, from Samantha uh, Hearn. Um, she just talked about accessibility and accessibility concerns. Um, and the question was, was what's your equitable plan B? So I don't know if we have time to just have a, a little think about that as a group as well. Manish, does that work? Has anybody got any sort of comments around oh, that? Sorry, I was, I was really busy typing something. So could you, could you just say that again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just ask you, digital accessibility and sort of what, what people are doing in terms of equitable concerns about the year we've had for students and just trying to balance what's been going on. And um, I think probably particularly for, for students who do have accessibility issues for whatever reasons um, and or who certainly in, in my experience who have been disadvantaged because they have never done online learning before and it's completely different. Um, so we had a little chat in the chat about it. So they've had to learn how to do that on top of everything else that was going on. And I don't think, I mean, I certainly didn't, I think I underestimated how much of an issue that was going to be for some of my students. So I ended up running some, just come along to an Adobe room, we'll have a chat, we'll play some silly bingo games, you know, learn how to use the mic, where all the controls are and all of that sort of thing, which I sort of, I mean, with hindsight, I should completely have realised that that was going to be a thing, but I sort of didn't because in my world, most people are pretty, you know, knowledgeable. And I teach um, level seven, I teach postgrads. So I just sort of, it, it was a completely wrong assumption. I shouldn't have assumed it, but I thought it would be easier for them than it was. Mm. No, I sense the, the, there's a little bit of a sort of a tension between the accessibility offers from the online, you know, and, and it, it sort of is both ways. It's some, in some ways it is better than the campus. And in some ways, it, it still needs. So I think we should we should we should nurture this topic in the coming weeks and and see what we can do around that. Perhaps so keep a note of that. Um, uh, yeah, that's all I can say at this moment at this point. I don't know because um, you know I did some work earlier, but uh, this was for Lancaster University about two years ago, so it's out of date. Whatever I did, so I won't talk about that on accessibility. Uh, okay, uh, Uncle Uncle, do you wanna? Uh, proceed or, or is there any other point or anybody else like to say anything about accessibility um, related topic? No, then in which case I think we can invite uh, Professor Ale Amorini for his uh, much awaited talk and thank you for being patient and, and, and being here. So over to you, Ale. Okay, thank you colleagues for inviting me to, to share uh, a few ideas with you today. It's a small group, so it's um, it's more likely to be a conversation rather than a presentation or a, or anything like that. So feel free to um, interrupt and show your horror throughout. Uh, don't wait till the end. Um, just get the horror out. Um, I should begin by saying that um, uh, my next door neighbour uh, uses a piece of technology um, apparently very well. It's called a lawnmower, uh, and he uh, 
picks, he has an admirable ability to pick his um, timings to do the lawn um, when I'm speaking at an event. Uh, so apologies if you, if you hear any, any, any of that in the background. <clears throat> um, I'm going to try and uh, uh, share some content with you now. Um, it's, um, it's a while since I, I think, I think it works. It's a while since I used uh, uh, Collab, but um, I think you should be able to see a, um, a slide now. So um, let, let me share with you what, what the plan is for today uh, in, the, in the minutes that we have together. Uh, we have um, essentially four, five bullet points, uh, four mostly content driven and, 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 and a Q&A at the end. Uh, and, uh, and of course, given the size of the group, don't wait till the end. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be asking um, uh, Anker and, uh, and manage to, to, to interrupt me at any point uh, with any issues that arise from the chat or, or anything else. Of, of course, put your hand up and, and, um, and interrupt. Um, I'm so sorry to see that you're going, uh, Marin. Disappointing, but there you go. Um, sorry, Ali, I'm sorry to interrupt as well. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Thank you for coming and, um, uh, and, and, and hope to see you at another event very soon. <clears throat> um, Marin, thank you. Right. So those are the, that, that's that's the plan for today. So let me let me start by by sharing some some principles, and then I'll move on to some of the earlier work. Um, and some I, I realise that some of these principles might might be a little bit um, debatable, if not controversial. But here we go. Um, this uh, this is a set of principles that, um, um, that 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 revolve around the notion of active blended learning or ABL, <clears throat> which has nothing to do with pushing technology down people's throats. Uh, it's about good design, good pedagogic design and teaching practice. Um, the second one is about um, um, uh, what, what is a good way forward when we design for good learning. Uh, so if we, if we use the analogy, what is the best way to write? Well, it's to rewrite. Well, we can, we can apply that and, and say, well, that the best way to design for effective learning is to redesign over and over again. Uh, the third one, uh, one I like very much and I've been uh, flying the flag for that one for, for a few years now, content is not king, context is. Uh, there is an obsession with, uh, with content. I love my content. My students love my content. If you're nice to me, I'll share some of my content with you. Um, actually, what matters is what students and tutors do with that content, why they do it, how they do it, who they do it with, and so on. Um, <clears throat> good contexts promote quality contact, um, and, uh, and that contact can happen in various environments, not just the physical one, uh, not just synchronous, uh, and we can have a, a long chat about that as well. Um, one aspect I'll delve a little deeper on in a few minutes is uh, very much uh, uh, around what we mean by blended learning uh, and what we should not mean by blended learning. But I'll, I'll park that for the moment because I'll go into that later. Um, let's think synchronous and asynchronous in whatever environment rather than the Velcro approach of face to face and online. It's, it's so interesting to hear people talk about the split between face to face and online in the same sentence as they're using to talk about a blend. So is it a blend or is it a split? Uh, and if it is a blend, then we should not be talking about separating the bit about face-to-face -face teaching, the bit about online teaching. We should really be talking about blending. And, and, and that does not always come across uh, uh, clearly in the, in the narrative of, of many of our colleagues, actually. Um, the, the, the second to last one is uh, the spot the difference one. Uh, again, one word I try to avoid is deliver. Uh, I hear so many people in the academic sector who should actually know better talking about content delivery as a, as a substitute or as an equivalent even to teaching. Uh, content delivery is one thing, teaching is another, and teaching well is another. 
uh, content is one thing, learning is another. Accessing content is one thing, accessing learning opportunities is another. Let's be clear about that. Um, so uh, there are many things finally that we can do with, in, on, or about learning. Deliver uh, is not one of them. So uh, just to get started on active learning before we move to active blended learning, uh, this is an old quote um, from 1991 that still uh, guides some of our thinking, that still guides um, many of the things we do with our students. Uh, it's not just about doing things, it's about doing and thinking about the things we do. Uh, and that is, uh, that is very much central to the definition of active blended learning I'll share with you in a few moments. Um, I'd like to set this task for you very informally because we're a small group. Um, uh, we can do this verbally, uh, we can do this in the chat, whichever way you prefer. Uh, I'm putting, uh, I'm, I'm giving you a list down the left hand side of words, active, blended, connected, distance, distributed. Um, and I'm giving you an, op an opportunity to think about words you associate and you do not associate with each of those terms. I will give you my own answer uh, uh, as an next slide, uh, but uh, can I invite you people to um, either grab the mic and and, 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 and share your thoughts on, on, on this, or indeed put that in the chat if you so prefer. Um, so just a couple of minutes to reflect on this. Words you associate with these terms and words you don't, perhaps the opposite. Silence. There's also an interesting question from Ed, Edward Bolton, if you can look Great. at it. Great. I can see that you are, you are you have, I didn't know you had the the functionality enabled, but if you have the functionality enabled, please write into the slide, which is what some of you are doing. Great. Uh, I, I couldn't see if, if you if you had those options on your screens. Fantastic. Thank you. Very interesting to see words like didactic in uh, in the second column because coming from a non English speaking culture myself, um, didactic is not a bad word in Latin literature and on learning and teaching. Didactics is actually an area of study uh, which is quite broad and and quite diverse and quite rich. Um, so it's very interesting when I when I interact with British colleagues and they talk about didactic as as a bad thing, <laughs> when uh, uh, when it means something very very different in in other in in literature in other languages. <clears throat> so we've got things like seamlessness between face to faceness and 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 digital. Uh, we've got connections, creative, engaged, energy, mm, involvement, students doing stuff, availability of help, mm, <clears throat> um, anytime, anywhere, on and off campus, physically, not virtually. Um, we have ideas around loneliness. We have ideas around teacher centeredness. Centralization, wall gardens, connections, creativity, emotion. Mm. Right. Thank you. Global, yes. Right. Um, that's been great. Thank you for, for, for putting into uh, in that into the slide. I can see in the chat as well uh, that people have shared, shared words like synthesis and integration and active and doing, um, <clears throat> which is which is great. 
Um, so uh, I'm going to share my answers with you, which is which are here. Um, and of course, some of that overlaps with what you've been adding into the previous slide. Um, I'm not going to read all of this. I'm just going to uh, highlight a few aspects of this. Mm, the blend and the second row, the blend uh, revolves around, for me, around creating the right context, uh, synchronous, asynchronous, uh, where motivation plays a key role. Um, that is very different from the dual track approach, which is the split between face-to-face -face and online, mm, uh, which I call simplistic. Uh, bear in mind, simplistic means one thing, simple means another. I like simple, I dislike simplistic. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that brings me back to the Velcro uh, analogy I was, I was referring to earlier. Um, connections or connected uh, re refers to, to, to the three, in my view, uh, to the three key types of interaction uh, that, that we find uh, in in face-to-face, -face, in online, in any type of, of blend, which is learner, 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 tutor, learner content. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> uh, and distance and, and distributed both for me have to do with location, have to do with place. Mm. Uh, now, uh, distance has more to do with pace uh, and autonomy. And, and, uh, and, and, and it does require a lot of resilience. So uh, that's, that's just a few thoughts which, which bring me nicely to what I said before about uh, components of blends. And there is a, 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 a focus, a, a historical focus on face-to-face -face versus online. And, uh, and I would argue that we should move away from such, um, such a focus and such obsession. There are many other dimensions. I put four here just for discussion, but not, not, they are not the only four. So we've got synchronous, asynchronous, whatever that happens. Remember, synchronicity can happen in and outside the classroom. Asynchronicity can happen in and outside the classroom. Who does what? Who facilitates what? Mm? Is it tutor facilitated, tutor mediated, or is it student mediated? Mm? Is, it, is it work done individually? Is it work done in groups? How does that interact with the other three quadrants? Blends are complex, multi-layered, messy things. We must not stick to the face-to-face -face online, therefore it's a blend. Please, let's move away from that. In the context of my previous role as Dean of Learning and Teaching at the University of Northampton, where I spent eight years uh, between 2012 and 2020, uh, we had three major uh, institutional large-scale projects running uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, today uh, they are illustrated here today I'm essentially focusing on that one which is uh, which is the bottom left and um, and I'm going to share a few couple of slides now that that you some of you may have seen elsewhere uh, indeed they may be they, they are part of the book that that Myron was talking about earlier so uh, this this one captures in a single slide uh, our early our, or earlier thinking around ABL, around active blended learning. Uh, in, in, in many cases, uh, people associate this with a flipped classroom, except that that bit in the middle, the sense making bit in the middle is often, not always, but often missing from people's designs. Um, and um, so, so a lot of people tend to think colleagues of mine keep telling me, yes, you, you give them material to read and they come to the next session and they haven't read it. Oh, surprise. <laughs> what a surprise. You give them videos to watch uh, and they haven't watched them. And in the next session, you've got to recap and, and waste time that we should be spending on discussion, doing the things that students should have before. All of that is true and there is no vaccine against that. There's no guarantee that whatever we do, that will fix it. But what we do suggest is that um, uh, that we should 
steer clear of approaches uh, characterized by read this, watch that, come back with three points next week. That is, we need to do better than that. We need to do better than giving simplistic uh, instructions like that. And we need to, to be more sophisticated in terms of the sense-making element, the, the scaffold that we build uh, around those elements of material and content that we're so obsessed with. Um, <clears throat> bear in mind that in that, uh, in that slide, we have, uh, there is no reference really to onlineness. Mm? Uh, there, is, there is no reference to digital, there's no reference to tech. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is about how people teach and how people learn. A more recent version of this looks like this, and that's that's more the, the like the one that appears in in uh, in the active blended learning articles and and and, the, and in the book. Uh, at the top, you've got the activities as center stage with embedded content. So what matters is what students do, hence the activities and the content, which is critical, mm, is embedded in those. Uh, so, so students need that content to be able to uh, to develop and to meet the, 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 the requirements of the activities. Then we have real-time sessions, whether that happens uh, uh, in, in the classroom or, or, or online, doesn't, it, it, it's not specified here on purpose, but what is specified is that it's tutor facilitated and it's primarily synchronous. And then we have a consolidation phase. Uh, uh, for evaluation reflection that happens primarily asynchronously. So that again is the same idea as the slide before. Um, what did help us a lot at Northampton was very much having a, an agreed institutional definition for what we mean by active blended learning. Uh, and that is what that definition is. Mm. Uh, it is. It is a um, uh, a pedagogical approach that combines sense-making activities with focused student interactions with content peers and tutors, the three types, in appropriate learning settings in and outside the classroom, with some uh, descriptions below or strap lines, if you like, below. So that's, that's the published definition, the official definition we've had for years. Uh, and and it, it helped us to galvanize what we meant by this. Um, so it, it helped us move away from the content bombardment culture of upload content, use your VLE as a content dump approach. Uh, this helped us move uh, forward in that respect. Not that it fixed the problem uh, fully, but it, 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 it did shift people's thinking towards student-centeredness, towards making sense of things, towards active learning, uh, towards using technology as and when it's appropriate to use technology. How did we do, how did we scale this up? Mm? Well, it took us uh, around five years, mm, five and a half years to do this. In that period, uh, we invested in human resource, uh, in expertise, in scaling up. We ran round about 600 uh, learning design workshops mm, that more or less looked uh, like this. Uh, this is based on <clears throat> on the original Carpe Diem approach that uh, that we, uh, Julie Simon and I, worked on extensively at Leicester Uni before my time at Northampton. We changed a few elements of it at Northampton. We had a different name for it. It's called Cairo, and it's not my idea to call it like that, but it, that was the name it had. As some of you will know, it's a staged process mm, that has a critical, very creative element around the storyboarding. Mm, and, uh, uh, and it is the storyboarding that enables, that enables the course team, the multidisciplinary course team to really uh, e express what they think the course is about uh, with learning technologists, with learning designers, with um, employers and with students. I can talk about uh, the Cairo approach uh, at length. There is uh, quite a bit of literature around this too. Uh, so any, any, any issues on that, uh, uh, we, can, we can discuss them. We are in the process of considering something like this at Portsmouth. 
uh, whether it's this or some of the other approaches which share some elements with Cairo, uh, but we're, we're precisely at that stage at Portsmouth now uh, with a view to scaling up a consistent approach to learning design that removes the, um, uh, the, 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 the content focus into interaction, knowledge building as a team. This is a team approach. <laughs> Ali, sorry, can I interrupt you? There were there were a couple of questions um, from Edward on the chat. So one of one of them, um, and Edward, you might want to help me over here. One of them says, "Do you have a contextual example of this, which I'm assuming is for ABL, I think?" Um, and then the other question from him was, "How did you deal with culture change and convince people?" Which I'm sure you might mention it later on. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, yes, um, the contextual example of this is I, I am placing this in context. I am, I am not uh, um, speaking about this in a vacuum. I'm, I'm explaining that this happened in the context of a university of, in this case, Northampton, and in, as, as we move forward at Portsmouth as well. All of this happened uh, in, 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 in the context of people having many things to do uh, many boxes to tick, lots of admin activity going on as well. Uh, this, of course, revol uh, Im impacts directly on things like validation, on things like change of approval, things like um, uh, periodic subject review. One of the key things that we did was incorporate this into those processes, into those quality processes, so that uh, there had to be a pretty good reason for a course not to have undergone a redesign process like this uh, before a uh, periodic subject review or revalidation or any of those processes. So all of all of these things that I'm saying is uh, happen in context. Uh, they 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 are very much um, a story from experience in a in a university that 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 of course had many. Uh, additional priorities as well. Um, in terms of the culture change, uh, that itself can generate uh, uh, probably a couple of new sessions just on that topic. I do have a couple of slides on that later, so I will temporarily park this uh, and I'll return to that in a few minutes. But um, uh, just as, as you would probably imagine, highlighting benefit was the absolute key thing here. Highlighting benefit of this approach and indeed of similar approaches like UCL's ABC approach that is uh, raised by Samantha in a, in a, different, in a different point. Uh, ABC and this share a number of features. They differ in a number of other features and we can talk about that. Uh, both have uh, significant advantages, both have some disadvantages, but um, the, the, the outcome is meant to be similar in that we want a team approach to scaling up course design. We want a team approach uh, and a consistent approach, uh, which does not mean identical, it means consistent, where the values across the board are shared, uh, although each teaching act will, of course, differ. Um, so, uh, so yeah, the, 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 there is a, there is another question which I've just noticed in the, in the chat, uh, uh, which is about whether the work at, uh, at Northampton was driven by the move to the new campus. Uh, <clears throat> no, <laughs> no, it's the other way around. The new campus followed this. Uh, when I started at uh, Northampton in 2012, I had no clue that we were going to be in a new campus at the end of 2018. Uh, this work started long before. What, what, what did happen is that uh, the new campus gave us a deadline for this to be done because we designed the new campus on the basis of pedagogic principles that, that, uh, that active blended learning was, was promoting. So uh, Northampton's new campus without lecture theatres mm, uh, is, is an example of, uh, of, of what big decisions were made on the basis of how we thought learning and teaching happened at its best. Uh, so the new campus gave us a deadline, but we shaped the new campus on the basis of this approach. Um, so um, 
<clears throat> there are a few other points in the, in the chat as well that 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 we can that we can handle that we can tackle. Um, so uh, let me let me just move forward a little bit to see if, if they if those other the next bits help to answer some of these points. Uh, and if not, we will of course return to them. So um, this is a, a little a little task for you, uh, which you can do on top of the slide or in the chat if you prefer. Um, so um, a course that is not taught in active blended learning mode uh, looks like what? So I've told you what ABL is, I gave you a definition. Hmm? What I'm asking you is for you to tell me what ABL is not. Hmm? So can you can you experiment a little bit uh, here and, and, and put in some, <coughs> some answers uh, in, into the slider in the chat? Extra. Mm -hmm. Remember, this is this is what ABL is not. Mm -hmm. Content dump. Lectures. Mm -hmm. There's no evidence of student centered activities. Mm, there's no evidence of engagement. Mm -hmm. So a clear answer there. Lectures, repository, afterthought, peer learning. Yes, all of that. <coughs> Reflective practice. No evidence of that. Oh, someone's deleted the lot. <laughs> right. That was that was my mistake. Sorry, I clicked the wrong button. That's my sorry. Really sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Really sorry. Um, really. <laughs> So uh, I'm, I'm going to give you my answers, as I did before, uh, which are very much in sync with or in line with what you've just put in here. So a course is not taught in ABL if it makes regular use of non-interactive lectures. And I, I pause there for a moment because in no way am I suggesting that, uh, that, that, that lectures should never happen. Uh, what I'm saying, every good blend has some element of various uh, of various things so some component of various things and and there is a point about using lectures here there but well, the problem be, the problem uh, arises when the lecture becomes the regular uh, perhaps the default uh, means of transmitting information and that is where we have a problem here, this, this, this relates to a later point about <clears throat> the absence of teacher training and teacher education in higher education, uh, where people do lectures sometimes because they have to, sometimes out of necessity, but also sometimes because that's what they know what, how to do, and they have very little knowledge of other methods. And, and, and we need to be quite blunt about that and quite transparent about that. And that's exactly one of the things we said um, uh, at Northampton. And, and we put in place a range of other uh, alternatives available for people to learn from. <clears throat> um, so every good blend uh, will have a bit of this and a bit of that. And teacher centeredness is one of those bits, uh, as long as it's used mm, in moderation. The VLE is primarily a content repository or a, or a content dump. Um, online activity is an add-on, mm, so it's an afterthought, if you like. Uh, so this is the Velcro thing. So I'll do my face-to-face -face bits. I'll, I'll, I'll just put a few bits online, so that's fine. I'll tick the box. So I do, I do blended learning, so everyone is happy. Uh, and there is no evidence of systematic enhancement is the final bit. But all of the things that you said um, <clears throat> to uh, would work here equally well. Um, so uh, let me let me just move because we we have been focusing so far on the earlier work if you remember my plan uh, it was principles and earlier work <clears throat> i'd like to move a little bit into um from the published definition of abl that i shared before to this definition uh, of blended and connected which is the 
which is the terminology, which is the narrative that was in place at Portsmouth when I joined <coughs> in September. <coughs> and um, so this is a draft definition that my colleagues and I have been working on in the last few weeks, uh, which makes use of the earlier one, but, um, but adds a few uh, new elements. So this is not official, but it's a draft um, piece of work that, that we've been doing. <coughs> and again, uh, some common areas, synchronously and asynchronously, in and outside the classroom, through activities, <coughs> taking ownership, uh, critique, in incorporate new knowledge, mm, um, application of that knowledge. Mm, not This is not just about skills, it is about knowledge. Uh, and uh, removed from here is the, is the sense-making bit, which was thought to, uh, to be rather too cognitive if you like, uh, but uh, with a view to making the definition accessible to a broader audience, uh, the, the idea was um, to, to make this, uh, to, to, to make those changes and, 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 and sort of uh, soften some of the elements of the previous definition. <clears throat> so this is, this is where, we are, where we are at and to, to kind of to end this section, um, uh, of, of the sort of uh, principles and earlier work. Uh, just a couple of things. <clears throat> One is uh, some literature on this, and this is the book that Marin was referring to earlier. Uh, Marin wrote the preface to this book, uh, and uh, the, the book has uh, two, uh, sorry, four open access chapters, uh, and, and uh, out of a total of 15 chapters. And it's got a nice uh, uh, intro and, and preface, as I said. So uh, a few articles there on ABL uh, as well. <clears throat> and uh, the final one that I wanted to share brings me back to the, the, the change process, uh, the culture change. This is, looks very funny in, in, in Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, the, the, origi the original slide is rather different from this, but <clears throat> the, the, the key elements are there. If we look at uh, the three big overlapping circles, um, the uh, change to active blended learning over a period of five and a bit years sits very much in the yellow bit, bottom left, developmental, incremental, change within the culture, making small incremental changes uh, from what already exists. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, response to COVID, so emergency remote teaching, ERT, as it's often called, would sit at the top as responsive reactive. Mm -hmm. And um, a change such as building a campus without staff offices mm -hmm, would sit in the bottom right as radical innovative uh, with its pros and cons. Uh, and the, 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 the key element there is, is shifting any change that happens uh, in the periphery if you like, when we have evidence that it works, that's a key part, shifting those changes from the periphery to the middle. So uh, the concept there is from innovation to mainstream enhancement, the new business as usual. Uh, and that's pretty much what we did. Uh, active blended learning at Northampton is not something we do in addition to our job. It is our job. Uh, and that is the new business as usual. And I think before I move on to the final bit of, of the presentation, uh, it's probably, Anka, a good, a good time to, uh, for you to, to give me a, a bit of a summary of any questions or points in the chat uh, so we can address those and then move on. Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks for that. Um, I think there were, there were a couple of questions. Um, one of them, I think, was from Edward as well. But he, he said it can be left until the end. Um, and it was it was more in the context of he pretty much wanted an example of where it went from read this and come with come up with three points and what it looked like after the implementation sort of thing. Um, but basically, he wanted to understand the model of how did it look when academics actually did it sort of thing. Um, okay. So do you want me to address that first um, briefly and then we move to yeah. another question? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, we uh, we provided extensive uh, examples <clears throat> of, of what that might look like. And of course, what that looks like will differ from context to context, from discipline to discipline, 
and from person to person and even within a single person's own practice from the morning group to the afternoon group if you like uh, but um, uh, we we worked on the basis of what I would call flexible templates uh, ways to turn a, a question like read this watch that come back with three key points which is uh, perhaps a, 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 an overused and abused approach to uh, a, a, a slightly more structured, focused, benefits-driven, uh, uh, um, aligned approach, which follows the uh, a bit of a of of a structure of a of an activity with its spark or um, uh, initial point of focus at the top, a purpose in one line, the task itself brief. Mm, an indication of time uh, needed to complete the task mm, and an ability to respond to somebody else's response to the task and we use that which is originally based on uh, on, 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 on Gilly Salmon's etivity model but uh, with with a number of improvements over time uh, we use that uh, as a as a as a flexible template as I said to guide the construction of uh, a rather more sophisticated set of activities that go far beyond uh, uh, the, the, the read this, watch that. So in, in, in brief, that's how we did it. And we scaled that up and we gave people the chance to, to, to have a continuum from very simple things that students can do in five or 10 minutes to, to mini projects uh, using the same template. Uh, and that that seemed to work and that seemed to, 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 to gain traction throughout disciplines, not just in some disciplines, but across the board. Um, uh, Anker, anything else? Um, and and one, one question from Manish is about, can you pretty much say what dictat, dic, that dictatic means elsewhere? Sorry, you, you cut out a bit. Can you oh, say? Yeah, so basically what Manish was asking was, can you mention what dictatic Didactic means elsewhere. Oh, didactic. Didactic, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I can't uh, say okay. it properly. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, the 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 didactics mm, with an S at the end uh, in in Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, French, and German, Danish, and Swedish. At least those are the ones I I am aware of. Is an area of knowledge. You have faculties of didactics uh, in those countries, in those universities. Uh, and um, didactics means the study of teaching practices. It does not mean teacher centeredness. It, it means the study of teaching practices. Pedagogy, on the other hand, is a broader term that is, has been used uh, and uh, reconfigured uh, across different cultures over the centuries. Uh, and from its initial meaning of uh, the, science, the art and science of teaching children, it moved on to many other things uh, and, and people use and again abuse the term pedagogy in all sorts of things. So, so for just to give you an example to illustrate the point, um, the, the, the pluralization of pedagogy, in other words pedagogies, uh, would be unthinkable. In, in, in Spanish or in Portuguese, it, it just wouldn't work. It, and it doesn't work because, uh, because his, uh, geographies wouldn't work either. Uh, you can talk about teaching methods, mm, but pedagogy is, is the umbrella term that covers all of that. So uh, I hope I have answered the, the didactics uh, uh, question on that, and I'm very happy to, 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 to discuss that further. But are there any other points, um, Anker, in the no. chat? No, that's it. And I think one final question, and probably colleagues have answered it, but it's like, will the sh can you share the slides with the participants attending? I know we are recording this, but if they want a, like a yeah. copy, yeah, that's 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 no problem. The slides uh, are available to all who want them. Yep, no problem okay. at all. Perfect. Uh, so there's a there's a comment from Samantha which which intrigued me. It's just about that she's been working okay. eight and a half years in 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 Mechi and things that are bread and butter for for herself are still not embedded so any sort of thoughts on on, on that maybe maybe useful for, for us so I, I i i'm sorry i did not understand the actual question no it was because i i taught secondary for eight and a half years so there are mm -hmm. things in a secondary classroom 
and the pedagogies are very different and they're very active. But mm -hmm. I came into HE eight and a half years ago and was like, what do you mean you're still talking to people for two hours? Mm -hmm. And eight and a half years later, it's still a very show, slow shift. Mm -hmm. in, in the, you know, there were things that I just did and covered in my PGCE, you know, 17, 18 years ago that are still kind of new and not embedded yet in, in, in HE. And it, it's kind of, I, I get it's a slow moving ship, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's a bit sad and disheartening if that. Yeah, I, I understand. And, but, but you see, the, you taught in secondary, which means that you had uh, a focused, uh, proper um, PGCE type teacher education program. Uh, the vast majority of colleagues in higher education don't. Uh, and bear in mind that professional recognition is not a teaching qualification. It's just professional recognition. Uh, so the, 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 the issue we find across the sector international, globally, not just in the UK, is, is one where a lot of people are asked to do activities, teaching activities, without uh, without a qualification that, that enables them to do so. Many of them are brilliant at doing that anyway, uh, don't get me wrong, but, uh, but that the, the, the absence of, of teacher education at ha higher education level and the confusion between teacher education and professional recognition prompted by these fellowships thing, uh, that, that adds to the problem, it doesn't fix it. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and I think we need to we need to be quite open about this as well, uh, and, uh, and and understand that that t teaching well is one of the key things we need to do in a university. And if we don't do that very well, and all we know is stand up and spout, then we have a problem. Yeah. Um, one one Colin, final think, one yeah? final question, Ali, um, is from Edward. He says, does pedagogy imply that teaching of children is more developed than the teaching of adults? Uh, uh, no, it doesn't imply that. The, ter the term per se does not imply that at all. What we, what we do know is that in this country and in many other countries, uh, in order to teach children, you have to have a specific license, a specific qualification. Whereas to teaching higher education, you don't. Uh, if you have a master's, a PhD, well, you're fine. Actually, you're not that fine. Perhaps you can do it very, very well. You can, indeed, you can do it brilliantly. Uh, but the, the prerequisites for primary and secondary school teaching mm, are quite strict. For teaching in HE, what you need is a higher degree. And, um, and in essence, with, a, with that and a bit, of, um, a bit of research and so on, it appears that you're okay. Uh, well, my point is that, and the literature corroborates this, uh, is that now many, many colleagues are not okay and they do what they can, mm, which is often not brilliant, what I would call brilliant practice. Okay. Um, so, I, think, I think those were the questions. We just got our final 20 minutes early, so yeah. So again, uh, thank you for all those points and very happy to, uh, to, to continue to debate them after. Um, I, I wanted to move slightly from active blended learning to ERT or emergency remote teaching. Um, a few things to, to say here. Um, uh, my experience uh, with uh, years of embedding and practicing ABL with colleagues at my previous institution, uh, that turned out to be an unexpected benefit, an unexpected good, very good thing in preparation for ERT. Uh, so in March 2020, mm, the jump from ABL to let's go full online wasn't that painful. The pivot wasn't that painful. Uh, and um, and the practices associated with online learning followed a lot of the principles that people had already acquired in relation to active blended learning. So teach student centeredness, activity, uh, interactions of the three types, um, 
uh, avoiding, uh, you know, uh, stand up and talk for an hour, all of those things mm, were already in place. There were some other problems, of course. Uh, uh, a, a, a typical one is timetabling. Uh, oh, if I have a, a seminar or, 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 or a, a session of any kind at, on Tuesday at three o'clock, all I'll do is I'll put in a, a synchronous session on Blackboard Collaborate, on Zoom or Google Meet on Tuesday at three o'clock and that'll be fine. That became an obvious problem as many of you will, 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 will have seen in, in your own institutions. <clears throat> we had a, a, a process in place um, sort of an on-the-fly staff development process in place that addressed such things and again it goes back to redesign which was my first slide uh, so, so redesign on the fly for an environment that that we were not expecting that we were not hoping for but that uh, prompted immediate change um, so challenges <clears throat> that 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 we found so there's two slides about this um, <clears throat> Uh, my experience there uh, was, and, and my experience from other projects, uh, is that staff took, in a very autonomous way, took charge of their own staff development, which was wonderful. Uh, they took charge of that development on the fly. They, they faced the problem and they tried different solutions and they were brilliant at doing this. Uh, there was no, or very little, institutional direction uh, from the 20th of March onwards things had to happen in a different way overnight and of course institutions didn't always have the opportunity to 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 offer uh, uh, instant guidance on this uh, people it has to be acknowledged that uh, that uh, implemented ERT rather than what you would call proper planned properly designed uh, online learning uh, so ERT was a beast that differs from what proper online learning is. Um, the, uh, the, the issue about uh, the absence of teacher education in, in HE was, was present from the literature, but from other projects as well. And um, <clears throat> nevertheless, many of my colleagues and colleagues globally that we surveyed as part of the EDU COVID-19 project claimed to be prepared. Uh, at least mentally prepared, <laughs> pedagogically and technologically to uh, face the challenge. And that was actually quite reassuring, although the results were not always the, what, what, what we wanted in terms of teaching quality, but they were, they were prepared, happy and willing to take the challenge on. The second bit of, of the staff challenges, <clears throat> uh, people requested consistently uh, support communities. Mm, they wanted to belong and one aspect of this is that is that synchronicity mm, what we're doing now as part of alt south as a community of practice if you like uh, synchronicity is an element uh, that 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 helps a little bit with belonging uh, same time same place uh, even virtually that helps attachment to colleagues attachment to students <clears throat> uh, a, a very regular consistent point made by by colleagues globally is that goodwill has an end uh, and it must uh, it, it will stop uh, so there is expected more than cash in the, in more than that is it's about recognition of the good work and that is a constant across across institutions uh, globally <clears throat> which uh, generates the notion that uh, we have a, a book chapter coming out on this uh, shortly on uh, emergency professional development uh, or EPD rather than ERT. <coughs> and, um, and, and this emergency professional development has a number of interesting characteristics and we can, we can discuss that uh, in, 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 in another session. Uh, just approaching the end of, of my session, colleagues, is um, just, just a few final reflections uh, uh, offered to you in the spirit of, of, of sharing lessons learned rather than uh, imposing principles on you. Uh, so uh, a few things uh, that are, some of which are obvious and you will be very, very familiar with, them, but, uh, but a few things to consider. <laughs> Let's not just replace 
things. Uh, if I had a Tuesday afternoon seminar, I'll do a, a, a Zoom session at the same time. Let's think again. Um, let's not use synchronous sessions primarily to deliver content. Takes me back to my first slide again. Uh, you can do many things with on and about learning. Delivery is not one of them. You delivering content is not what keeps communities together. <clears throat> Recording and uploading one hour lectures is not a good not a good thing. Um, um, the point about read this, watch that, uh, we've made enough. I won't repeat that. So um, let's not mistake content delivery for good teaching. Um, start or continue. Planning. Mm -hmm. Failing to plan is planning to fail. Uh, and uh, storyboarding, as I said before, in the Chiron Carpe Diem approach, that's, that's a brilliant way of getting people engaged in replanning. Mm -hmm. um, use synchronous session for motivation, for tutorial support, for consolidation, for cohesion and sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. You can blend synchronous and asynchronous work, even in short sessions. Do not apply the Velcro uh, approach. Add adding things uh, simply because the blend uh, is, is is bits of online and bits of face to face. Let's move away from there. Uh, let's continue to use what we know from distance learning research. We have institutions that have been doing this for decades and sometimes for a lot longer. Uh, not just the OU in this country, but there are similar institutions, a lot a lot bigger than the OU, that have been doing this for a long time. Uh, and let's think about. Uh, scaffolds in context, uh, not just promoting and bombarding students with content. My final point is about pre, during and post COVID. Uh, and, uh, and this is again uh, based on some, uh, an article I published uh, ages ago, but I, I, I kind of re, um, I retrieved it to, to discuss this. Um, if we if we have two axes here, the, uh, the, the x-axis, the horizontal axis, proximity, which is physical proximity, and the y-axis is synchronicity. Uh, the high high, so the bottom, the bottom left, high proximity, high synchronicity, is pretty much at the heart of what most campus-based institutions do. Mm -hmm. Those institutions also do bits of the other things, yeah, uh, and traditionally have done, but the bread and butter, uh, the source of income, uh, the attraction, uh, the, 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 the shared campus experience sits in the high, high mm, element of this. Now, when COVID hit, mm, that changed because that, that face to face ness had to be removed and, um, and we had to think of alternatives. So that moved into something like this, where a little bit a little bit, uh, depending on the period that we're looking at and when the regulations were relaxed, a little bit of face-to-face -face continued, but the majority of the activity did not happen face-to-face. -face. So we moved into the, the top left primarily, mm, uh, the high proximity for students who stayed on the campus mm, and low synchronicity, students on the campus but accessing uh, sessions remotely. Mm, and top right, which is uh, traditional mm, distance learning, students going home or to other places, even to their home countries, uh, operating for the most part as distance learners. And there's a little bit as well uh, uh, to be highlighted of the bottom right, which is real-time provision for the geographically dispersed students, uh, but uh, uh, again, synchronously, mm, low proximity, high synchronicity. Uh, What's likely to happen post COVID? Well, I'm, I'm not going to be very creative here. I'm going to just say that we need to do more of the lot after this. We will have to do more of everything. We will have to do more. And again, this, this is an interesting, uh, funny thing that, that, that Blackboard Collaborate has done to my slide here. But uh, in essence, uh, we need to do more of the lot. Uh, we, we need to continue with the face-to-face -face experience, the campus-based sharing, all of that that students so much want. Uh, but we need to do all of the rest as well. And we will have to live with this for a long time. So I think it is a good opportunity for us to get, to get ready for 
a few years, if not longer, of, uh, uh, of operating in multiple mode, in mu multiple mode of study, multiple mode of teaching. Note, I'm not saying multiple mode of delivery, which, which is the word I don't like. Uh, and th this, is, this is what this slide tries to show. We have to be, uh, to, to, to multitask in terms of modes of study mm, across uh, the different quadrants of this diagram. And with that anchor, I'm going to stop uh, and I'm going to hand over to you for a summary of the many uh, questions and things that might have been happening in the chat while I was talking. So, Anka. That's perfect. Thanks, Ali. Thanks for the presentation. Um, it always gets interesting. I've, I've attended this pro probably for the third or the fourth time, and I've, I've, it's always interesting to listen to this. Um, so there were there were a few chats, um, but I think most of it were answered. But then there were a few questions as well. Um, one of the question again from Edward Edward is about how do you create a sense of belonging? Um, um, perhaps uh, <laughs> if, if there was a single viable, um, never failing answer to that one, I think I think we would all be rich. But but we, <laughs> but 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 there isn't, uh, and and this is again extremely context sensitive. Uh, you create sense a sense of belonging in different ways across different contexts. Uh, and um, uh, the the if you like the one one of the traditional answers to this is by <clears throat> by making sure that you engage stakeholders in good time that you share values and all of those things which are which operate at a very strategic level but when it comes to uh, making them happen on the ground they are very very hard um, <clears throat> um, when it comes to learning and teaching. Mm -hmm, uh, the, the 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 meaningful combination the meaningful blend mm, of multiple learning environments multiple tools and multiple modes of study real time and not mm, in a coordinated well planned way helps massively with a sense of belonging in my case i i really value mm, the sense of belonging that is created through real-time activity, uh, although I I understand, recognize, and 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 and, and, and fully I am fully aware uh, that uh, that we cannot um, place too much emphasis on real-time activity in the times that we're that we're sharing together. <clears throat> but in my case, it does help a lot. Um, Well-planned activity along the lines of what I described earlier with that flexible template all of those things that we discussed in a in a in, in, in a self-paced manner within parameters mm, helps with a sense of belonging for learners so it's not a case that you you do a 20 credit module uh, and you start in in September and you say do whatever you want whenever you want uh, between now and December. Well, that, in my experience, does not help with a sense of belonging. What helps is um, what I call often a flexible lockstep, mm, which is a contradiction in terms, if you like, but but it, it, it keeps people working on roughly the same things at roughly the same times. And, and whether you use uh, a, a week or a fortnight as your unit of analysis, uh, keeping people roughly together helps with sense of belonging but what helps the most in my view is good teaching practice great um i'll come back to the other two questions in a minute but i think the next question that edward has asked sort of lines up with the first question so he's he's asked how do you get buy-in when you are asking academics to do more of the lot with fewer resources and limited time um sometimes sometimes we have choices and sometimes we don't <clears throat> when uh this is the first ever pandemic that that has occurred in my lifetime uh, and uh and, and so many most of these these things are new to me and, and sometimes we don't have a choice and we have to understand that if we are true to our values of of inclusion and of not leaving students behind and not leaving colleagues behind then we need to be prepared uh, for the unexpected and this is an unexpected situation and we um, 
we are asking more of ourselves <clears throat> we are asking more of our colleagues we're asking more of <clears throat> of our students <clears throat> and, and and i would argue that, that that the options are quite limited can we can we be in a position where we do not uh, where we kind of cross out some of one of one or more of these quadrants and we say well sorry uh, because we can't ask more of people and of students uh, we, we will not do quadrant three uh, I, I find that very very difficult to, to, to say and very difficult to to to, to action <clears throat> so yes there will be an adaptation uh, there will be uh, a, a, a reallocation of priorities. There will be a reallocation of tasks. Um, maybe there there will be a reallocation of of roles uh, in, in in institutions. Uh, but we cannot simply argue we cannot do one of the quadrants simply because uh, it's asking more. So so it is difficult. I don't have a a, a straight answer to that. But the fact is, for the time being and for the foreseeable future, we will have all these scenarios happening, unfolding uh, around our practice, and we can't get away from that. Perfect. Great. Um, the next question is from Mohamed. He says he, he quite likes what you did at Northampton in terms of tying up and incentivizing the learning design with the fellowship, and it, it seemed a good approach. Um, the question is, was there a high uptake of the learning design training by staff in Northampton before you left? Um, not, uh, well, uh, there's two, let's see if I understand the question right, but but uh, there's two bits to it. Uh, one is uh, the uptake uh, of the uh, scalable approach for people to put modules and programs through this. And the answer to that is yes, and we had a dashboard for that. And we could see who had done what, when, uh, who had facilitated what workshop with what output, was it validated, did it have problems, all of that, uh, the uptake was, was high, uh, not least because the benefits were highlighted, uh, not least because it was time well invested, not least because, because subsequently uh, regulations included those things as, as, as requirements. Uh, so there was a bit of carrot and a bit of stick there as well. Um, uh, the other bit of it is 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 what about the facilitators uh, and uh, uh, and to scale this up you need to scale up facilitation uh, and and on that we had uh, significant interest from a central team that we recruited specifically for this uh, but we also had uh, significant interest from academics themselves who see themselves and still are doing this. Uh, as facilitators for such workshops in the faculties, uh, and that was uh, that was very helpful because uh, we had we had subject specialists doing this sort of thing, having been trained to do this sort of thing in a uh, in, in a in a very natural way, uh, having themselves been embedded in the faculties for many years. So I, I think I would answer that question from those two angles. That yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. Cool, that's great. Um, and finally, I think there's one, yeah, one last question is from Edward. He says, how do you get the balance of content online so students are not bombarded, especially as every student might have different capabilities and work at different paces? Um, uh, always hard to, to, to give a generic answer to getting the balance right that is that that alone is a perfect example of good teaching versus less good teaching it is down to the person making the calls there the facilitator the mediator <clears throat> so uh, it is really down to them to establish what is what is a happy balance what is the right balance that my students will be comfortable with what is the right balance and let's go a step further uh, uh, to create an environment from which my students cannot escape without learning mm? and, and and that is at the, at the heart of good teaching I, I wouldn't be able to to come up with a recipe for uh, for getting the balance right you need to do these things but I would encourage you to think in your context, how would you describe 
that balance. Have you tried this? Have you tried that? Has it worked? Has it not? Can you adjust accordingly? And bear in mind, the next cohort of students, because teaching is unique, will be different. Uh, and the teaching act uh, will not be replicated. It will be new. It will be a new one that will be the only one that your new students uh, will have experience of. That is what makes teaching so exciting. That's great. I think, I think just listening, I mean, hearing comments from Samantha earlier where she was a bit worried and stuff. I'm assuming, and Samantha, you can quote me over here based on your final comment. You said, love that, which means not that you've converted, up, but I think it's helped sort of thing for you to, to have steps going forward. Um, one comment that Manish has made is, is if we, and I'll, I'll repeat his comment, is he says, if we can crack quad four, which was one of the option in your in your in your chart the others would be catered to a larger extent i would just like to get your comments on that um yeah uh, i suppose uh, is, is is quadrant four uh, the bottom right uh, or yeah yeah but bottom right okay so so let me let me go back to um uh, this uh, let me go back to that so if i'm let me go back to to here to see if i we understand the question right um so if if quadrant four is indeed the bottom right <clears throat> uh, then uh, to be to be frank um the, the bottom right is not the one that worries me the most um, uh, the bottom right is, is quite straightforward to implement, technically easy to implement, uh, and I'm talking about this real-time provision, so, so low proximity, high synchronicity. Uh, it, I'm not that worried about that, uh, because in any scenario that will not be the bulk of the study mode. When we move post-COVID, that will be a bit of it, but the chunk of it, I would argue, will be the other three. Uh, so uh, I um, it might be just me, but uh, the the um, I, I don't think getting quadrant four wrong will destroy uh, uh, the the rest of the good work. Uh, if we make mistakes in quadrant four, we can fix them. Uh, but if we make mistakes, serious mistakes in the other three, we have rather more significant problems. That would be my position. Great. Any other questions? All right, uh, there is one which says post COVID, do you think that teaching will return to pre COVID? <laughs> yeah. No, uh, 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 some some would love that to happen. Uh, and maybe they force it to happen. Um, uh, but uh, no, I think uh, there will be many many interesting beneficial changes uh, hopefully adapting many of the things that we've learned many of the practices we've used in the pursuit of doing more of it all uh, we can't do more of it all unless uh, we adjust practices and unless we apply things that we've learned uh, and we continue to learn in this period uh, to a, to a post covid scenario uh, so um, just just think about think about your time on campus uh, I, I really don't think uh, we will be uh, on campus as much time as we used to uh, and uh, and that itself and the same is true of students um, that 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 itself will will signal a, a change in how we operate uh, for all of our activities, not just our scholarly activity or our teaching activity, it will impact on many aspects of our day-to-day -day work. And, uh, and, and therefore, I don't think we will return to uh, a pre-COVID scenario uh, as we understood it. Uh, there will be a, a rather modified version of that. Right. I guess, yeah, we've, we've run past two minutes with the time. So I'm, I'm going to pass it to Manish and yeah, just Pretty much. And thank you very much, Ali, for, for the presentation. I, I, find it, I find it amazing all the time anyways, but I'm sure the others would have as well. Uh, I'll pass it to Manish and yeah, he can pretty much. Thank you, Ankur. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, uh, 
uh, Debbie, and I think Merit's left. So, uh, and, and thank you most of all to, to all of you who have, who have come for, and, and spend the last two hours with us. And hopefully it's been useful. You know, we, we said that we we'll look into what 2021 will be, will be like, and we probably can't do that without sort of bringing in what, what we have just experienced, which uh, Ankur very, uh, you know, usefully sort of uh, brought that out from, from all different um, members today. Um, I mean, it's, it'd be hard to, to summarize everything, but I would say that, you know, the key things that, that um, were highlighted in, in Angus session were, were structures quite important for students, especially when they are not out and about in front of you. Uh, it, it has some advantages for, obviously, for engineers, as, as I said, but, but I think more generally, everybody likes a little bit of familiarity and so that they can uh, um, get yeah, well once they get used to it everything is familiar but uh, in a new world when you're suddenly going in a, in a new place you you do get confused a little bit and only with several iterations of that newness that you become master of any new you throw a new world at any you know uh, at this experienced person then they'll be fine so that kind of has an analogy with with level one le level four level five level six if you throw something at level six student more likely more likely that they will be successful than the first year student who's coming off, you know, from a home environment into a university campus environment. So yeah, I, I guess um, so, um, in uh, in terms of uh, yeah uh, future sort of events and summaries, we as I said earlier, there will be um, monthly sort of tech Thursdays at the so which will be the last Thursday of each month where we can come back and, and discuss with us uh, within, within the group as a group of friends really to, to help each other and support that's that's what the purpose of this network is is to, to provide a sort of a sounding board for, for your ideas regarding learning technology and and how to to take those forwards forward can I so can I, in, can I interrupt you Manish sorry sure, uh, Ali, sure, so Ali probably wants to add something so uh, uh, simply, simply with, in, 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 um, in the interest of leaving uh, this group of colleagues with uh, a bit of homework, if you like, a bit of something to think about, uh, just to, so that you go away and you say, well, was he crazy? What did he mean? Um, well, I, 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 I wanted to, to, to ask a question and, 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 and let you think about it as you, as you go away in preparation for the next Alt South meeting. Um, particularly because this is a, the association of learning technology yeah so um, <clears throat> uh, have you thought about the concept of book enhanced learning or pencil enabled learning if, you, if not then why are people so fixated on the notion of technology enhanced learning um, is it just because of the the novelty? Is it because of the new tools coming out all the time? I would argue that basic technologies like the pencil and the book uh, are far more powerful and enhancing than many of the toys that we see today. And um, and in that context, should we also think not just about technology enhanced, but also technology undermined learning or technology weakened learning? Um, just to think about is is book enhanced learning pencil enabled learning something that um, we should think about or not that, that's a good good uh, thing to to think about in the coming days and weeks uh, I, I think technology is more of an enabler than than enhancer but uh, you know uh, it's it, but we want to we want to be in a place where where whatever technology that you're using can actually make a significant enhancement but in, in this case in the COVID case I think it's been more of a more of an enabler isn't it because otherwise we wouldn't be doing any of the work that we haven't done so yeah we will we will well, mull on that uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the for the for the coming sessions uh, and see if we can come back to you and 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 report back saying this is what we have found. Uh, but but on on the on the on the topic of finding things and reporting back, uh, I think the research journals that are focusing on learning technology, uh, including the, the uh, research in in uh, learning technology, the old one, um, they from time to time call for for various systematic reviews, some meta analysis where you actually put together evidence and, and you know 
to, to, to help future researchers. So one of the things that I'm, as I said in the beginning, I'm very interested if people are, are wanting to, to form group of authors and, and work together, if you would like to do that, please reach out separately uh, or say it in the chat here uh, on my email, whatever. And we can look to run some sessions on systematic review and, and to support you in, in researching that side of things. Um, maybe even building and evaluating uh, learning technology solutions, because uh, I myself have done some work on that before. Um, but we'll be interested to, to see if there are collaborations possible in future. And uh, lastly, about the next few meetings, as I said, 29th of July is a Thursday of the next month. Uh, I'm sure you will be somewhere on a beach somewhere <laughs> by that time. But but if not, and if you're willing to, to tune in, please, uh, you know, for an hour, uh, we'll, we'll send you the details of the timing once we figure that out. Uh, hopefully the same time, same same place as, as Ali was saying. That gives the some sort of sense of belonging, really, that, that this is our community. We meet every month uh, on a set day, set time. But having said that, we all have difficulties around our own, own calendars sometimes, uh, and we want to be flexible and, yes, um, still predictable that they, we're going to be there on the, those dates. Um, likewise, in September, we'll have a, an event uh, which will be similar to this one where we invited speakers. So please, if you have ideas, suggestions for speakers to, to rope in for this session, please let us know. We'll, we'll try and contact them. Better still, if you have already contacted them and they're willing to, please let us know. Um, and uh, what was it? Yeah, the vacancies, uh, I think, Lucinda mentioned in the beginning. There are some officer spaces if people would like to engage a little bit more in the activities in planning things for, for our future events. We are just at the moment three people or four people, actually. Um, but we need, to, we need to have two more officers. So please feel free to, to reach out for, to us on, on that. Uh, other than that, I think we've already gone 10 minutes over, so I won't take too much more of your time. So thank you. Thank you all for, for, for your contributions today. It's been very, very useful, and I hope it's a beginning of a very uh, connected journey that, that we have set about in the coming months and years. Okay. Uh, listen, that you don't want to do any uh, further addition to what I've just said, or is that... No, really, just again to, to echo what you said and to thanking everyone so much for coming and for their contributions. I certainly found it a really helpful and productive session. Thank our speakers, particularly Ali. Um, that was just so helpful for me in terms of ways of thinking about it. And um, so it's greatly, greatly appreciated and really hope to um, see um, all of you uh, at some of our future events. Okay, great. Thank you for coming, and we shall meet again uh, next Tech Thursday, like July 29th. Great. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 So the recording is with you, yeah? Yep.